this chapter, we're going to introduce some of the basic ideas of probability. In this lesson, we're going to look at theoretical probability. Okay, hi everybody. In a previous lesson, we looked at an experimental probability. An experimental probability is is probability that you have observed, okay? You went out, you did some some research or you watched something happen and you you tabulated it, you you calculated the number of times the the event happened out of the total number of of possible outcomes there or to the total number of events that have occurred. And you calculate that. Now, a theoretical probability is a little bit different. A theoretical probability is what you anticipate should happen. Okay, so it's the number of ways event A can happen, really, over the total number of possible ways uh, a scenario can end. And we have talked about that before. Let's say you're going to flip a coin. Well, before I even get to the coin, I don't even have to flip it. There are two sides to the coin. If I want to know what the probability of getting ahead is, I know that there's when I flip it, there's only one way I can get ahead out of the two possible results that you get. So the probability is one out of two. Okay, that's just the way that works. Now, if you, excuse me, if you start flipping that coin, okay, and you, you, you do it a lot, and like for the first few flips here, I, maybe for the first six or seven flips, I flip it and I, maybe I get ahead every single time. Well, you know what, that's, for a very small number of, of trials, yeah, I don't really expect to see that probability pop out. But if you start to flip this 100 times, 500 times, 1,000 times, then I expect that the, the experimental probability should get closer to the theoretical probability, okay? Now, that's important to note here, that for a small number of trials, okay, I don't expect the experimental probability, what I actually see, to match up with the theoretical probability. Okay, that's, that's not in the nature of probability, okay? When you flip a coin twice, I do not always expect to see a heads and a tails, even maybe even in that order, right? Like, I can't be that, that uh, strict in my thinking about that. But over the long run, that should kind of, that should kind of, um, well, it should approach the, there's a, actually the, the limiting behavior of that, if you want to be kind of technical about that. But the, the way that uh, probability, experimental probability should behave is it should get closer and closer to the experimental one. Now, if it doesn't, then something's probably wrong and there's something else going on there that you're not aware of, okay? Somebody, for example, if you're talking about dice or whatever, the dice might be loaded, somebody might be trying to cheat. Anyway, let's take a look at some examples here. Okay, let's have a look at this example here. It says, the following spinner is used in a child's game. Okay, let's just make sure that that's, that's clear here so you can see what's going on. Okay, so there you go. So the first question is, what's the probability that the spinner of spinning a square? Okay, now, I have got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I've got eight possible outcomes. So the probability of getting a square, okay, and this is just the theoretical probability. I haven't spun it yet. Okay, I haven't actually watched this happen. But I've got eight possible outcomes. How many of them have squares on them? One, two, three. So the theoretical probability of getting a square is three out of eight. Now, if you don't, if you don't really like that number, if that doesn't communicate something to you, then you might want to write this as a decimal, 0 0.375. Okay, so roughly there's a 37.5% a chance you're going to get a square. What's the probability? of getting a triangle or a circle. Well, again, there are eight possible outcomes. Now let's take a quick look at that spinner again. A triangle or a circle. And remember, we said this before, or implies addition. So a triangle, I've got two triangles. And a circle, I've got three circles. So that's going to be, if I put that together, that's gonna to be two plus three, okay, over eight, five over eight, and to put that as a decimal, just to maybe help you get a better sense of what the value is, it's 62.5%, okay? Now, what about the probability that you get a circle on your second spin if you spun a triangle on your first spin? Whoops, spun a triangle on your first spin. Okay, you can't see the whole question here. So let's just maybe zoom out a little bit of that. 
what's the probability that you get a circle on your second spin if you, uh, if you spun the triangle on your first spin? Well, see, here's the thing. Does the first spin have any impact at all on the second spin? And the answer to that is, is no. These are what we call, okay, these events are independent. Okay, so the first event, the first event has no impact on the result of the second. So the fact that you, the fact that you rolled a, a triangle on the uh, first, well, that, that doesn't mean anything. What's the probability? Okay, so this boils down to what's the probability that you get a circle? Well, let's go back up and look at that. I've got eight outcomes. I've got three circles. Okay, so this is going to be the probability of getting a circle is going to be three out of eight. It does not matter about that triangle. And this sort of thing happens all the time. In fact, um, uh, if I might be getting this wrong here, but I believe this is, this is called the gambler's fallacy. Okay, when, when people make mistakes, uh, assuming that events are, are dependent when they're not. Um, when someone goes to, a, uh, to a, a slot machine, puts money in, if they can play it over and over and over again, every time they play, the probability is the same. The probability doesn't change. Okay, often there's this idea that if I've, if I've played it and this machine hasn't paid out in a while, that it's due to pay out. The probability is higher that it will pay out at some point. But that's, that's not true. That's not the way that's built. It, it's like when you, when you go and let's say your, you, uh, your favorite coffee shop has a, uh, a contest and you, you get your cup and there's, let's say, a one in six chance that your cup is going to win a dessert. Well, if you buy six of them, does that guarantee a win? Well, no, no, because the probability is the same for every cup, okay? Uh, the events, buying a cup, uh, one cup, does not have any impact on the event of you buying a second cup. They are what we call independent. Every time you grab a cup, it's one six. That next cup that you, let's say you've purchased five cups and you lost them all, the probability on the next cup is one sixth. Anyway, I hope that makes sense. Okay, next question here it says, in a family of three children, the first two were boys. What is the probability that the third child would be a girl? Now, look, I know that there are issues here, that there's other things going on, but let's just, just take it kind of at face value here. Um, this is going back to that same scenario that we were just talking about in that previous question here. Do, does the fact that the first two children were boys, does it influence whether or not the third child is, is a boy or a girl? And I, I think, and I might be wrong here, I think the actual answer to this is yes, it does have an impact. That's not where we're going. We're not trying to be so picky here. Uh, the probability that the third one is a girl is really just going to be one out of two, okay? Uh, without having any kind of uh, discussions of, about any of the, like the biology of it or whatever, because I don't know much about that, okay? The intention of this problem is really just to emphasize uh, the fact that um, the, the events here should be considered independent, okay? Okay, so for this next problem here, it says a bag of marbles contains six red marbles, 10 blue marbles, and uh, four green marbles. Now, based on the fact that this is a probability question, we probably need to take advantage of uh, the moment here to tally them up, and so we've got 20 marbles total, okay? That's probably gonna be our, our denominator here. So it says Janelle reaches in and grabs some marbles. What is the probability that she grabs a green marble? Okay, so the probability of getting a green, well, we know that this total is going to be 20, and there are four green marbles. Now, we probably should reduce the fraction. Okay, so 4 out of 20, 20 is also divisible by 4, so I can divide numerator and denominator by 4 to get 1 out of 5. And if that doesn't communicate enough to you, you can convert that to a decimal to get 0.2. So really there's this 20% probability that you're, you're going to get a green, or she's going to get a green. Now, what is the probability that the second marble is a blue marble if she put the first green marble back before drawing the second? Now, as soon as she, as soon as she does that, okay, as soon as she puts that in, these events, the events are independent. 
So as soon as she puts that first marble back in, basically the whole pro, uh, question resets. So the probability, okay, that the second marble here is going to be blue, well, there are 10 blue marbles out of 20 marbles altogether. So that's one out of two, okay? Or as a decimal, 0 0.5. There's a 50% probability that she's gonna grab a blue. Now, what is the probability that the second marble is a blue if she did not put the first green marble back? Okay, these events, okay, the events are dependent. Now, that first event is causing a change in the scenario that we're looking at here. So, this is how we're going to write this. What the question is asking, what is the probability that the second marble is blue? And I'm going to draw a vertical line here to indicate that this event happened first. So what we're looking for here, what's the probability that the marble, the next marble is blue, and this line here means given that the first marble was green? Well, thing is, there are still, okay, even if, even if she doesn't put the green marble back, there are still 10 blue marbles in that bag. But instead of being, instead of being uh, 20 marbles in the bag, now there was only 19 because that first green marble had been pulled out here. Now, that maybe doesn't communicate anything to you, so let's, let's take a quick look at the decimal here. And the decimal is gonna be approximately 0.5, and I'll, I'll go one up here just so that we see that it's not 50% here. Okay, it's a little bit better than 50%, so 53%, okay? And then the last one here, what is the probability that the third marble is red if she did not return the green and blue marbles she already drew? Okay. So again, these are dependent. There is, a, there is a relation here. So what is the probability that the third marble is red given that, and we, we can write here, and it doesn't really matter at this point here whether she pulled out the green first or the blue first or whatever, but we had the blue and green. Well, we haven't pulled out a red yet, and zinc. there were six red marbles in the bag. So there are still six red marbles in there. And, and by the way, I assume... Like we assume success in the previous questions. We always assume success. So we assume that, that when we talk about the probability of getting the green, that she got the green. Probably of getting the blue, that she got the blue, okay? So here we're gonna assume that those blue and the green are out of there. And so now, what are we left with? Well, there are 18 marbles left. And then again, I should simplify this if I can. And both of these are divisible by six. That becomes one third. And that's going to be approximately 0.33. So a roughly 33% chance uh, that given that the, the green and the blue marble are out, that the third marble will be red.